Thanks a lot. I'm, I'm happy to be here, happy to be invited. Mike and I had this uh, agreement over, uh, Mike Soraki, where'd he go? I know he's dying somewhere, but he, oh good. He, uh, we had this agreement, I think there was alcohol involved, that we would each trade talks. So <laughs> I get to go first. <clears throat> now I am a, a biologist who studies marine mammals, whales and dolphins and occasionally pinnipeds, but they tend to be looked at as, we've been trying to reclassify them as invertebrates, so um, <coughs> hasn't worked yet. <coughs> but mostly I work on cetaceans, and my specialty has been on uh, North Atlantic right whales, so a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about is about that species, because as the rarest whale in the world, it represents a lot of the things that we have done to whales all over the world. But I will bring in some other examples of uh, various problems of whales living in the urban ocean. And uh, there'll be some fun along the way. So why are whales in danger? Generally, of course, they're endangered because we killed them. And uh, we did a really good job of it all across the entire globe. <coughs> in some areas, um, whales were brought completely to extinction. For example, in the eastern North Atlantic, Right whales are considered extinct, although we occasionally see one or two from the western side. The, there used to be gray whales in the North Atlantic. Those are also extinct, um, although there was one seen in the Mediterranean last month, so, but he probably came from the Pacific. And uh, <coughs> there are other populations of whales that are brought to extinction as well, mostly from whaling. Now, overall, you know, whaling was tremendously efficient, started in the, really over a thousand years ago. And uh, it actually started on right whales. And right whales were the right whale to kill because they floated after they were dead. They yielded a large amount of oil. And they had very long baleen, which is used in the old days as plastics. They used them for combs and buggy whips and all kinds of things. And of course, corsets, which everyone needs. <coughs> and then the whaling, of course, became much more commercialized in the 20th century. And uh, what we were not, what our Yankee forebears were not able to finish off, a lot of the uh, high level industrial nations were able to do, especially in the Antarctic, where hundreds of thousands of whales were killed in about a 40 year period. So that's why most, many whales are endangered. Many whales have recovered. The North Atlantic right whale has s recovered very slowly, and I'll talk a little bit about that and why we call it the urban whale. There are about 430 or 440 right whales left alive in the North Atlantic. Um, they are growing extremely slowly, about 1 or 2 percent per year, but we've had periods of time when uh, the animals actually were in a state of decline. And the reasons for that I'll talk about a little bit, but we uh, have basically decided to work on two areas of this population problem. The first one is reducing the human caused sources of mortality. And the second one is trying to figure out why reproduction is relatively poor and see if we can figure out anything that we can do to fix whatever is inhibiting that reproduction. So both sides of the equation, you want to have them have lots of babies and you don't want to kill them off if you can help it. <coughs> the aquarium has uh, pioneered a lot of the work on right whales and the way we do it is most, is started originally with photographic identification of individuals not very complicated. Right whales are pretty funny looking. In fact, ugly, if you want to be truthful about it. And their faces are distinctive just the way humans are. And so you can, in fact, tell them apart in the field from photographs. Or some of my staff can actually tell about half the population in the field just by looking at them. Um, so we use photo identification to track individuals all over the uh, North Atlantic. And we also uh, do a variety of other things. We use uh, biopsy sampling uh, to sample for genetics. We are able to tell. We have complete genealogies of about three quarters of the population. And of course, biopsy sampling allows you to sex the whales. And um, we also can use it to look at uh, skin lesions and other kinds of things that are affecting health. 
Uh, we monitor reproduction and mortality by looking at animals that are born, calves that are born, and following them through their lives, and then, of course, animals on the beach. You can tell apart either genetically or through photo identification. We curate the catalog for the North Atlantic, and it represents over half a million photographs. And thank God I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> So this is, uh, this is the two sources of mortality for right whales that are not natural, are collisions with ships and entanglements in fishing gear. And the collisions with ships one is uh, particularly gruesome, um, but it is a, and people ask, well, you know, how come you can't hear the ship? Well, it's likely that they do hear the ships, but ships put out sound at very low frequencies. Very low frequencies travel long ways through the ocean with very little directionality. If you're underwater and near a big ship, you will, this, you will hear the sound, but you won't be able to tell which direction it's coming from. And we think the same thing is happening with right whales. They can hear them. They just don't perceive them as a threat. Uh, the sound is all around them. And of course, if you get hit by a ship, you're not likely to survive to tell your buddies, look out for this sound. So there's no learning curve. So whales get hit by ships a fair amount, and um, about 35% uh, of all mortalities of right whales are uh, due to ship collisions over the last 30 years. And this is why. <coughs> if you, um, let me see if I have a little pointer here. What is that? Uh -oh. Does it work? <laughs> all right, I have a finger. <laughs> so right Oh, it's working? It's probably, ah, there we go. So right whales occupy this kind of uh, dark gray zone from about uh, West Palm Beach up to Nova Scotia, a little bit to the north. There are a few stragglers that go up into uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence off the Gas Bay. And the critical habitats, this is the calving ground for all right whales in the North Atlantic. And these are the feeding grounds in the springtime. And then in the summertime, the animals move up to Roseway Basin and the Bay of Fundy. However, about a third of the population disappears in the summertime, and I spent a lot of time getting the daylights kicked out of me in the middle of the North Atlantic looking for that other summering ground, but it's probably up here somewhere. But in this area where mothers and calves go, especially down in the south, <coughs> you can look. This represents the call-in data from something called the ECOADS database. And this represents shipping traffic along the east coast of the United States from 1983 to 2002. It hasn't changed much since, since then. The high density shipping is in red, and areas with low density of shipping are in blue. And what you can see here is that the habitat for whales and the habitat for ships is almost a complete overlap. On this map, you can't really see very well, but there's a lot of little uh, whale tails. Those represent dead right whales, and the white ones are unknown mortality, but the black ones are uh, from ship kills. And you can see the concentrations of ship kills are exactly where you would expect them, the heavy ports. So Jacksonville, Florida, Chesapeake Bay, and uh, off of New York and Boston. There are also, the St. John was a problem originally as well, so. However, <coughs> there's been huge advances in this area over the last uh, few years, and in fact, in the last year and a half, um, the National Marine Fishery Service in the United States passed a rule whereby ships have to slow down to 10 knots when they're in various habitats where right whales occur during the seasons in which they occur. So the one that's closest to us right now, of course, is the area off of Cape Cod. And ships have to slow to 10 knots from April, April 1st to July 31st in this area and from March 1st to April 30th in here, and likewise, uh, January 1st to May 15th in here. And this kind of dynamic or uh, seasonal management program uh, is used not only here, but also in the coastal waters of the southeastern United States where the calving ground is. And it means, it's, and we've looked at the, uh, the transmission data from the ships, and there's very high compliance. So we're feeling pretty confident that this is going to solve the problem. Because if you think about this, <coughs> it's really a squirrel in the road problem. You're driving down the road and there's a gray squirrel in the middle. Now, how fast do you have to go not to kill it? Well, if you're going 10 miles an hour, you probably won't kill it because the squirrel is going to do this and then it's going to go. <coughs> it's going to get out of your way. But if you're going 50 miles an hour, it's probably going to get killed. So this pretty much, this is the kind of 
uh, paradigm that we're working on here. And we're hoping, we haven't had, since this went into effect, we haven't had a single right whale kill from a ship. So we feel pretty confident that that part of the equation is uh, near to being solved. <coughs> In Canada, they took a different approach. And uh, working with the data that we've been collecting in Canadian waters for the last 25 years, 30 years, we actually worked with a couple of corporations, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the Department of Environment Canada and the Transport uh, Group in Canada, as well as the International Maritime Organization, and moved shipping lanes away from right whales in the Bay of Fundy and created an area to be avoided around the Roseway Basin critical habitat. So we think that that area is also a lot safer than it used to be. And we haven't had a ship kill there in a couple of years. So I'm feeling optimistic that both countries have made uh, some significant progress on this. <coughs> so the second problem that we face with this species and many other species as well is entanglement fishing gear. And this is a lot more complicated because no fisherman wants to entangle a right whale. And of course right whales are not fond of getting entangled. The, the the data show that 71% of all right whales in the North Atlantic have been entangled in fishing gear at some time. And that's from, we can see it from scarring on the tail stocks or on the flippers or on the mouth. So a lot of whales get entangled means a lot of them get free. Um, so the good news really is that most of them free themselves, but we do lose about two per year to entanglements. And we may lose more that just disappear from us and we don't know how, what the source of death was. Now, the efforts to, dis to prevent entanglements have included a variety of things. Um, there have been lots of weird fishing gear that has been tested and failed. And um, people have tried uh, various sorts of uh, breakaways so that whales could break themselves free. And in fact, currently, all lobster gear, you have to have a weak link at the top of your vertical line so that if a whale does get caught up near the top, it can break free. So there's been a lot of measures that have been put into place. The most controversial one was uh, last year, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service mandated that all the ground lines, that is the lines between the traps, now have to lie on the bottom, took them out of the water column. Now that probably reduces the entanglement risk for right whales and probably for humpbacks and minke whales by about 20%, 30%. So that's a significant reduction. Uh, but the fishermen are putting up with a lot of losses of gear because uh, on hard bottom, in tidal, high tidal zones, the ground line actually abrades fairly rapidly and breaks up. So when guys are trying to pull their gear up, they frequently lose their gear. So it's a bit of an issue. Uh, and I think that we are uh, probably seeing some benefits to the whales. It's a little hard to tell because when we look at entanglement rates, we're not seeing the reduction that we'd like to see. Uh, but in the meantime, um, the way that most disentanglement stuff is resolved right now, when an anim animal is entangled, it gets reported through a hotline and a team or a group of teams from the s coordinated by the Center for Coastal Studies and the National Marine Fisheries Service go out, chase the whale down, attach themselves to the line that's trailing off the whale, work their way up to it, and then try to cut it off. And um, Humpbacks are pretty easy. If you, if you catch a humpback in a line, it pretty much is a, it's like a cow. <laughs> you know, they really are not very dangerous. Uh, a, a right whale, on the other hand, will try to kill you. So that one gets your attention. And I have, uh, there's, a, there's a general disagreement within the disentanglement community. This is the Center for Coastal Studies guys, and they work with very long poles to reach up forward to try to cut lines that are entangling the whale up forward. And you can see in this case, this whale's got a buoy here and a buoy wrapped down on the side here and rope tying across the back and across there. These entanglements are extremely complicated and you have to cut from the, you'd like to cut from the front of the whale so it falls off the back. But it is a dangerous thing and we, everyone recognizes it's kind of a stopgap measure. You really rather not have them entangled. <coughs> One of the other things that we've been assessing is whether we can figure out um, where the highest risk is. So this is a map of fishing gear plotted times SPUE stands for sightings per unit of effort. You can put sightings on a map and it doesn't mean anything. All it means is that you were there and you saw the whale. But if you put sightings relative to the amount of survey effort that was there, it gives you a density function 
that you can then multiply times the fishing effort. And you can actually figure out, well, where's the high risk areas? So in this case, in this map, which is very preliminary, the red represents the high risk areas. So maybe instead of targeting the entire fishery, you can go after the high risk areas and say, okay, we're going to just focus on these spots and figure out if there's some kind of gear that we can use that won't kill whales. So there's some progress being made, but it is slow. And I suspect that um, we'll be working on this for another 10 years or so. It's a big deal. And there's a lot of fishermen who have been really active in trying to figure this thing out, a lot of biologists and a lot of, uh, um, a lot of cooperation. Uh, but we're still looking for the magic bullet. So, so that's, the, that's sort of the story of the, <coughs> the physical or the human causes of death in right whales. And that affects many other species as well, minke whales, humpbacks. Most humpbacks get disentangled by, uh, by the disentanglement team. We lose a few. And then uh, most minke whales die because they're too little to, and we don't hear about them. So, or sometimes, uh, in fact, many minke whales are disentangled by fishermen and we also don't hear about them. Although we might hear about them, but we don't tell anybody. So. <coughs> Um, so we'll go on to the reproduction side, which is more interesting because it's more complicated. Um, this, what I'm going to show you now is a uh, courtship group in right whales, and uh, hopefully there'll be some sound with it. And I'll try to explain what's going on because it's a little confusing. Can you hear that? So in right whales, courtship or what looks like courtship occurs almost year round. And it usually involves a single female and multiple males. And what we do when we process a group like this, and it can be up to 40 or 50 animals, um, remember, single female. <coughs> no one's really responding to this. I'm thinking, are you guys paying attention? So. Uh, what we do in a, in a situation like this is try to identify all the members. And as you can imagine, it's mostly like photographing a washing machine with some body parts <laughs> flying through it. <clears throat> but uh, what's interesting about this is that these things form uh, when a female calls underwater and uh, attracts males to her. And the reason for that is that um, she's, trying to make, she's trying to make a selection of the best possible male. Now, you've got to think about right whales a minute. They're not very good looking. They don't take care of the babies. They don't feed the mother. They don't do anything. But they're good at this. <laughs> so the female has to get lots of them in there to figure out who the best one is. So that's generally the motivation behind it. Anybody want to see it again? Get some notes? <laughs> All right. Can you tell which one's the female? Oh, you want me to show you the female? <laughs> you can. The female is amazing. She lies on her back, unavailable to all the males. And the males are all... <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny about that? <laughs> so she, she's unavailable to the males. The males all get in there, and they're competing for access to be right next to her. Because when she rolls over for breath of air, then one of them can roll under and mate with her. And I imagine it's pretty chaotic underneath when that happens. But at any rate, uh, that's generally the strategy. And this thing can go on for seven or eight hours. Animals will come in and out. Uh, a male occupies that alpha position where he could actually mate with her only about 15 minutes before he's displaced. There's a lot of competition in these groups. It's pretty amazing. So. 12 months. Yeah, once they're, once they're conceived. What's interesting about this is we see this uh, a lot in the fall big groups in the fall, but the babies are almost all born December and January. So we think conception is occurring in December and January, possibly November, December, but a lot of the courtship, we, in November and December, not many of us are out in the North Atlantic and we don't see these guys. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's not, it's, there's a little bit mismatch in the timing. We think that a lot of this is practice, that they're working their way up to the sh main, main show, so. Beg your pardon? Single calf. There are records of twins in the South Atlantic right whales, but not in the North. So. Uh, multiple partners. Many, 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 many partners. Oh, there is one little part that I forgot to tell you. The male right whales have the largest testes in the world. 
and they are, uh, I mean, we're talking Volkswagen here, they're a thousand kilograms. <laughs> and the reason for that is that it's a sperm competition system, so uh, this is more than you wanted to know, isn't it? <laughs> Anyways, it's a very interesting mating system with interesting complexity. We, in our genealogies, uh, we have females who have given birth to seven calves. In one, in two mothers, they have, uh, in, in seven of those, uh, two mothers with seven calves, I think uh, two of the calves have the same father and mother. And all the rest are different fathers, same mother. So there's a, they, these competition groups are designed, like I said, to get the best male that's good at mating. And that apparently confers some kind of fitness down the road for the baby. So, uh oh, don't do this to me. Okay, so eventually they have babies. Babies are born in the southeastern United States in the coastal waters between oh, about Savannah and Jacksonville. And uh, the baby's born at about 14 to 15 feet, grows within eight months or so to about 28 feet, doubles in length, and that's a cube in size, so just imagine how the mother feels. <coughs> the mothers <laughs> were called, the mothers that were caught in the spring whale fishery off of Long Island in the 1700s were called dry skins because the calf had more blubber than the mother did at the age of four months. B the, ca the baby just sucks her dry. All the lipid in the mom goes into the baby. It's really amazing transfer. Because the babies are weaned at eight to 12 months or eight, yeah, about eight to 12, just say 10 months. And at that point, they're on their own. And at that point, they, that's when they get into trouble because they're wandering around looking for mom. They're looking for something to do. They're looking for playmates. And mostly, they're trying to figure out how to eat, so. <clears throat> so why do we worry about calving? Because, you know, they have lots of courtship and they make quite a few babies. So if you look at the uh, data from other right whale populations, and there's a right whale population in South Africa, in South America, one in Argentina, one in uh, Australia, one in New Zealand, uh, and there's one around Chile. The population growth rates for all the southern hemisphere right whales is this curve here. It's about 7% per year. If you look at the North Atlantic right whale, this is the population growth rate as modeled. This is the data from the catalog, and this is the minimum count. So we don't really trust the green line. But all these, these agree very well. So this is about 1.5%. One, one now, if we were able to stop all shipping mortality and all entanglement mortality, we estimate that the North Atlantic right whale would actually grow at about 3.5%. So the red line would represent that. And the difference between that line and that line represents unrealized reproduction. Now, why is that? And that's the, that's the focus of a lot of studies that I'll talk about quickly. So these are the things that we worry about uh, when we think about what the urban ocean. They, these guys live along the most heavily industrialized coast in the, in, the, um, in the world, basically from Florida to Nova Scotia. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on in there. First of all, everything west, I'm sorry, everything east of the Rocky Mountains goes into the Atlantic Ocean. So everything you flush down the toilet and put on your fields or spray in your fields eventually washes down, broken down in various compounds, so it's not all straight. But there are a lot of contaminants, and there's a lot of pharmaceutical compounds that are uh, pumped into, that are not separated out by sewage treatment plants, and they go directly into the ocean. Uh, there's weird metals, there's weird uh, plasticizers, things that make our soda bottles soft. Um, and there's, of course, flame retardants, which have now been found in sperm whales all over the ocean in fairly high concentrations. So these are the things that, in fact, we worry about, not because they've been shown to have any effect on right whales or any other whale species. Uh, it's because they've been shown to have effects on lots of other marine animals that are lower in the food chain. And so we worry about the transmission effects upward. On the left side, you see things that we're actively studying. We found uh, a variety of things. Um, and I'll talk a little bit in detail about noise, but I will mention a couple other things. Uh, I know this, this is a very strange photo, but 
It turns out you cannot put a right well on the examining table and ask how it's doing. I know that comes as a shock to all of you. <laughs> However, uh, it turns out that you, and you can't really take blood from these whales because the blubber thickness is about this much, and a hypodermic that went into a whale to get blood would probably not come out, or if it did come out, it would be bent, or you would lose all the blood in the ocean. Anyways, it wouldn't work. So, aside from that, I probably couldn't get a permit to do it. <coughs> but it turns out that you can get all these things from feces. So, about 10 years ago, we started collecting feces from right wells to have a, an exam, to start looking at the possibility of uh, testing a, a, their health in a variety of ways. And uh, then it turned out the humans aren't very good at this. But dogs, anybody have a dog here who likes to roll and <laughs> you know what I mean. So it turns out that dogs are four to five times better than humans at finding poop at sea. Right whale poop floats. And so the dog was trained on right whale poop and we started collecting samples in a systematic fashion. And it turns out that, um, <laughs> yeah, so this dog is amazing. This dog, I had, a d I was sure I was sure he was pinpointing on a whale, and I'm driving the boat, and the, the whales, whales are all around us, and the dog's like, no, no, just pointing. And uh, our trainer told us, trust the instrument, and the instrument is the back end of the dog, because the tail wags when he gets close. He said, trust your instruments. And sure enough, the dog led us a nautical mile through whales to a sample. So <laughs> it's very impressive. Now, it turns out that from this you can actually, oh no, you have to go. It's very, it's actually quite a sophisticated system because, anyways, this is also more information than you want to know. <laughs> um, so, we have extracted now both reproductive and sex hormones, uh, I mean, uh, reproductive and stress hormones from every sample. So, we can actually tell you these things function as pregnancy tests, they tell you the age of sexual maturity. They can also uh, <coughs> tell you whether the animal has been stressed or not, and what degree to the to which degree the stress is actually affecting their reproduction. We've also identified both uh, giardia, or commonly known as beaver fever. I think if any of you have spent any time in the North Woods, but it's actually endemic to right whales. It's a specific species for uh, that's found only in right whales, and we've also found cryptosporidium. We haven't been able to genotype it, but it's possible that it's a human strain and it looks like it's associated with poor health in right whales. So there's bugs that these guys get and they are, uh, a lot of them have it. We also found a number of marine biotoxins, both uh, PSP, your shellfish poisoning in right whales, and we've also found domoic acid. Uh, and we found them both in the same animals. So that's a first for marine animals. Um, we've been doing health assessments using photographs that we normally take for identification to tell how healthy the whale is, and there's people who've been studying nutrition and how whales uh, metabolize their food. And then I want to talk a little bit about acoustic measurements. We do quite a few recordings, and uh, that turns out to be important for some of the other stuff that is coming up next. So, anyways, we have a large research program on trying to understand the failure of reproduction or the various periods of time when reproduction has been low, and uh, it's kind of interesting, and it makes for very amusing stories. So, now I'm going to talk a little bit about acoustics, because this is one of these new hot topics that people are all of a sudden becoming aware of. Marine mammals are primarily acoustic creatures. Remember that if, uh, that they live in a water, they live in an environment where the visibility is 20 feet, 30 feet. So imagine, uh, it's like living in a really thick fog all of your life. Um, and so they use sound a lot to find their way around. So a few basic vocabulary pieces. This is a right whale uh, contact call, or how right whales say what's up. They come into an area, this is what they'll do. So, okay, everybody? <laughs> Anyways, you get the idea. So that's, that's pretty straightforward, and these calls are found all over the Eastern North, or Western North Atlantic, um, where right whales occur. And it's a really good way to determine when right whales are in a habitat. Now, this is a sound that is, this is from that courtship, or from a courtship group like the one that you saw the film of. And this is quite different. And this is the female. So that may 
not sound very attractive, but the boys like it. <coughs> now, here's what's going on in the Bay of Fundy. If you look at a 24-hour period in the Bay of Fundy and you put it on a sonogram, which is this uh, sonograph, which is this upper right-hand corner here, uh, the red represents sound intensity, and every one of these big red bleeps here is a ship passing through the Bay of Fundy up and down the shipping lanes. And I'll play three representative uh, ship sounds. They're different, but um, you at least get a, sense, you get a sense of what they sound like underwater. So now what we're going to do is we're going to play that call and we're going to see if the boys can hear it over this. And you get a sense of the problem that right whales are going to have in an increasingly noisy ocean. <laughs> So that's, that's the concern that people are having about noise in the ocean. And it turns out that there are places along the east coast of the United States, you know there's uh, OSHA requirements for the workplace where you're not allowed to have a certain noise level above which it becomes dangerous to humans. And there are places along the east coast of the United States, I think they're often in Jersey actually, um, th where the OSHA requirements for humans are exceeded underwater. So this is a this is largely ship traffic, but it also includes recreational boating and a lot of sonar, some military activities, and in particular, seismic activities. So let me play you this, because most people don't realize in order to find anything in the, in the deep ocean so that you can drill it, I know we're all anxious to get out there and do that right now, but the seismic exploration that's used to find oil and gas deposits sounds like this. Hmm. Now this is 20 miles away. <laughs> These are called air guns and they put out this very high decibel, I mean extremely loud, you do not want to be near this in the water, it will kill you. Um, they put out this extremely loud sound that is pointed downward and then the echoes are read by sophisticated equipment off the under below the sea floor so they could find deposits. Now, <clears throat> when I was, I was at the uh, at our minerals <laughs> management service meeting in, Mo in uh, Virginia when they opened that lease sale off of Virginia and uh, there was a bunch of these companies there that do just nothing but seismic work because every, every oil company the results from these surveys are proprietary, so they pay for them. So if there's 10 oil companies, there's 10 seismic ships out there. In Malaysia, there's currently an a oil boom going on, and there are 25 seismic ships operating 24 hours a day around that part of the world. So this kind of sound travels thousands of miles underwater and contributes to this kind of ambient noise problem. So this is what a blue whale used to be. The acoustic space is something defined by my friend Chris, Chris Clark as the distance that a whale can hear and be heard. And the acoustic space of a blue whale 50 years ago was this, and now it's this. And that difference is primarily due to shipping and seismic exploration. It's just too loud for them to hear. Blue whales have a very low frequency call, down about uh, 17 to 20 cycles per second. So below the area, almost below what we can hear. And that sound is actually completely coincident with most of the very low frequency ship traffic. So that's the reason for that change in space. But it's an issue that has come up now and it's going to become more and more important. This is a, te there, is, there are technological problem, uh, solutions to this one. If uh, many of you may remember when airplanes, jet airplanes got a lot quieter because of the noise considerations around airports in the 60s. And lo and behold, when they got quieter, they discovered they were saving 10 to 20 percent in fuel costs because noise is wasted energy. So you make them more efficient, you make them quieter, you actually get more efficient uh, propulsion. So I think there's solutions to this one. 
Now, uh, a little bit about oil, because it's sort of on our minds. <coughs> so this is the first lease sale to go up in the Atlantic uh, since the moratorium was lifted. And as you can see, we happen to plot uh, right whales, humpbacks in green, right whales in red, humpbacks in green, sperm whales in purple over the top of the lease sale. And you can see there's a lot of whales around here. Mostly, we would have said, uh, you know, five months ago or two months ago that this isn't a problem too much. You know, we're worried about the seismic stuff. We're worried about possible leakage, minor leakage from the rigs. But given the deep water that this is in, you're looking at the continental shelf edge. If you look at the, um, the, the depth here, this is 200 meter line. The next one is 400 and 1600. And this line here is 2400 meters. So almost, you know, seven or 8,000 feet. Uh-oh. I broke it. So uh, given the trouble that we're having in the Gulf of Mexico right now at 5,000 feet, you can imagine this is a little bit worrisome. So these are the kind of things that um, are starting to worry people more and more. This is actually a photo from the Gulf itself. And you can see there's a lot of activity underway there without much effect, as far as we can tell. So oil has become, uh, obviously, in the forefront of everyone's mind. I think. There's a couple lessons to be learned from it. One is, thank God it happened in the Gulf of Mexico because it's warm water. It will be visible for a long time and people will pay attention to it. The last big spill, we, I mean, everyone remembers the Exxon Valdez, right? That was in the world, in the pantheon of world worst oil spills, that's number 53. It doesn't even rate in the top 10. The top one was the Kuwait oil fires from the first Gulf War. The second one was Ixtoc in the Gulf of Mexico in 1979. That was 140 million gallons. This one is 110 million gallons, and there's no sign that it's going to stop. This will be number two shortly. So the good thing about oil and warm waters is that it breaks up pretty quickly. The other good thing about it is that it's actually relatively, uh, in this form, it's relatively digestible. And I don't mean that everybody's going out and eating it. I just mean that it is possible to, to metabolize many of the compounds of crude oil for many animals. It is probably lethal to larval fish, and it's lethal to filter feeders, and it, of course, doesn't look, it's lethal to birds if they get it on their oil, uh, get it on their feathers. Um, but it's one of those things that it, because it's in warm water, it may actually eventually break down. If this had happened in the Arctic, this would be a 100-year disaster because oil doesn't break down in cold in the high Arctic. So there will be huge consequences to the ecosystem there, and there'll be huge uh, breakdowns in ecosystem services. They will probably lose large sections of uh, you know, mangroves and grasslands and things like that. And those are the those are the areas that actually feed m many marine ecosystems, just as the seagrass beds do here and salt marshes do here in, in Maine. Um, so there's going to be profound impacts here, and w it's hard to know where it's going to play out. In terms of whales, we don't really know much about it. There's been very few studies on the effects of oil on whales. We know that they have been seen surfacing in some, um, some oil spills, and we know, of course, that there have been dolphins seen now down in here in the oil spills, but we simply don't know what the effects are going to be in the long run. Mostly, we're worried about the uh, food chain effects. So, uh, I wanted to mention this because wind power is very popular in Maine, and I think it's popular in many places. It's not so much that the wind power itself is going to be an issue, but it creates a lot of activity in the ocean, and we're continuing to put more things in the ocean. Aquaculture is right behind it. Lots of people want to put aquaculture pens offshore. And every time we do that, we have to service those facilities, and we have more boat traffic and more noise. So these are the kind of things that we're thinking about. And then the final thing, of course, is uh, the elephant in the room is climate change, which is coming to a place near you, whether you like it or not. And um, this is simply the uh, uh, oceanic heat content change uh, from 1955 to 2005. And it's not that the, this is not this is nobody's projection. It's not an IPCC or IPCC uh, estimate. It, this is the data. This mm -hmm. is what has happened in these in this period of time. So, we're going to see warming temperatures and warming. The, the oceans are going to change a lot. 
they probably, probably will shift the animals northward, may uh, cause some ecosystem collapses in some areas. Um, it's going to affect fisheries, it's going to affect marine mammals, it's going to affect humans. And we, we just have to worry about adaptation. Now, my view on this is that when you think about what we do in the oceans right now, the cumulative impact uh, in many places is not so harmful. There's not much going on in open ocean areas, in some of the more wild areas. But along the east coast of North America, there's a lot of activities there. This is a map that um, we made. The marine stuff is the cumulative uh, intensity of fishing, shipping, and uh, sewage outfalls and dump sites. And so you can see there's some places you'd probably rather not be in the marine environment, mostly off of Long Island. But in the, if you add in the other, the, the watersheds which drain into the ocean, which give you a good surrogate of uh, things like oil runoff and pesticide runoff and pharmaceutical runoff, then you see that there's, they're mostly a proxy for population density. So Florida um, and uh, parts of New York and, you know, there are areas where you have a lot of uh, impact in the watersheds that are draining into the Atlantic. So one thing that we could do to increase the resilience of animals facing and ecosystems and fisheries that are facing climate change is actually reduce the existing anthropogenic impacts. The kind of stuff that we put into the ocean Everything is a little bit of a stressor. Nothing will kill you, but every little bit might hurt. Yeah. I see many in Nova Scotia agreeing that the ocean is orange in that area. Why is the difference there? Fisheries. Fisheries. Yeah, it's just that it's, this isn't, an, this isn't a, actually a great example. I mean, this, this might not be the best way to do it. There's probably indices that would be better weighted for dealing with this, but the, the, this is primarily related to the lobster fishery because of the intensity and density of it in the summertime. So it's heavily weighted because of that, but the actual watershed is pretty clean, and the ocean minus the fisheries would be pretty clean too. So, um, but I I think that uh, the resilience question is actually one that we should be paying attention to. If we can reduce these other kind of stressors, many animals, ecosystems, and fisheries can be can withstand temperature changes. It's the multiple changes that happen to them and the multiple stressors that make it more difficult for animals to adapt. And so I think we need to not just focus on things like oil spills and climate change and uh, noise, but we need to focus on the whole thing. We need to think about all the other activities that we can do to improve uh, water quality and reduce uh, human impacts in the ocean. And I do think that the uh, Techno mostly these are technological fixes. Some of them may cost a little money, but most of them are in hand and just need the po sort of political willpower to make it work. Thank you. So I guess we can take a short break and if people want to refresh their drinks and then continue with the discussion. This is a great talk by Scott. Copy of that sometime. Um, be aware of it. Uh, so let's just open the floor. Uh -oh. Yes. Well, there was a failure in the attempt by the IWC to actually bring it under control, so it'll continue to be a research hunt, which means it's not really controlled at all. Um, but the Greenlanders are a subsistence hunt. They fall under a separate category, and they were allocated a uh, subsistence quota, just the, just the way the American Inuit are in Alaska. So, th but in both cases, um, the numbers that they're taking are not there won't be not there won't be any population consequences. There will be emotional consequences, <laughs> you know, because if they start taking humpbacks, they're probably taking humpbacks that Americans go whale watching for on the east coast of the U.S. So. 
Yeah. Um, what's the lifespan of a red whale and how do you tell? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, well, <laughs> we don't tell. Uh, the only, we have a photograph, the last right whale killed in the United States was a baby harpooned by some sport fishermen off of Florida in 1935. And there was a New York Herald Tribune photographer on board that day and he took hundreds of pictures and they published a double page spread in the Herald Tribune and there's pictures of these guys standing on the dock like with, not with fishing rods but with a harpoon and the baby whale is hung up just like you would catch a big fish. And everyone was, you know, totally proud of him and all that. So <clears throat> the mother was photographed in 1955, again in 1969, and then in 1995 out on George's Bank. So at that time, she was at least 66 years old, assuming that she gave birth at the youngest possible age of six. So we think that right whales can probably live to be 100. There's evidence from... Uh, bowheads, which are their close cousins in the Arctic, that those animals can live to be almost 200 years old. So they would be the oldest mammal in existence. And that evidence is from stone harpoons uh, that were probably implanted in the early 1800s by the early Inuit whalers. So the, if they're, they're obviously comparable in size and metabolism, they live in a more war a warmer environment, so they probably don't live as long. But it'd be easy to imagine right whales living over 100 years. They've seen a lot, the big old ones. Well, the females that we have, that we've managed not to kill off, some of them are, I think we had one, gave, had her eighth calf this year in a period of 35 years. So they appear to have quite a long reproductive lifespan. And we think actually, having watched the, this weird variation in reproduction over time, is that the strategy of a right whale is to live long, and if you have a bad period, you just don't have babies. You don't worry about it. You just go on about your business. And then when things are better, you have lots of babies, or as many as you can have. So that's about one every three years. It's not a lot, but, you know, if, the, if we had a lot of females producing eight or nine calves, <coughs> that would be more than replacement. We'd see much better growth rate. So, But we have some females that have, are... 22 years old and never had a baby, so it's really a weird mix. What's the ratio between the male and female in their 400 It's 50-50, equal numbers of males and females. But um, remember, if a female gives birth every three or four years, then only one of the adult reproductive females is available for every four males that's available in that year, because the males are always available. But the females are you know, only available once every four years. So all of a sudden, you can see how this, uh, this big courtship group evolved, or how that system evolved. It's because they, uh, it takes a long time to raise those babies. And the mother takes a long time to recover. So once they're pregnant, it's 12 months gestation, then you're nursing for 10 months, and at the end of that, you are dry, you're done. So you disappear. The, animal, the group of whales that we see least in the entire population are are two-year mothers, because they're worn out. They do not want to be anywhere near males, so they go away. So effectively, you only have a quarter of your population of females, is that what you're saying? No, no, only, the, only a quarter of the adult females are available each year for reproduction. Okay. They're around, but, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, are northern right laws considered really a separate species from the southern ones, or are there any, is there any evidence of that they could interbreed or anything like that? Or are they really a separate? Well, no, no, they're definitely separate species. They've been separated by over a million years. Um, there have been times when things were really grim in the North Atlantic that a bunch of us, I think, again, there was probably alcohol involved, but we were talking about, <coughs> we were talking about getting one of these big, uh, uh, you know, dry dock ships and filling it up with right whales in Argentina and driving it north. <laughs> But um, the, the, the problem with the, the, the reason for the separation is two things. One is remember that everybody moves north and south of the season. So in the southern, when we're in the winter and our animals are south, they're in their summer and their animals are in the Antarctic. So the separation is like 10,000 miles. 
The second problem is that gray whales don't have any trouble staying warm. They have a problem getting cold. So they have, because of the blubber layer and the lack of dorsal fins and small, relatively small flippers, they retain heat really well. <coughs> they cannot go in temperatures above about 26 degrees centigrade. I don't think we have any records higher than that. And the, it is about 600 miles both sides of the equator where you get about 30 degrees. So that pretty much eliminates their ability to go across the equator. So it's a thermal barrier. Oh, I don't think you really want to answer this, but um, like just talking about conservation, I've read about in like a lot of Eastern Asian countries, like whale meat and other products kind of show up in the market, and they market it as accidental bycatch. Would you think that that's actual bycatch, or is it more of like maybe illegal whaling operation? Uh, there are in in Korea. It probably is a bycatch. They report it as a bycatch. There's a lot of gillnet fisheries there, and the bycatch is all minke whales, and minke whales do get caught in gillnet. Mm -hmm. So I tend to believe that one. Um, there's not a formal hunt in Korea. There's no central processing area. There's no ships that are mounted with harpoons. All the rest of the whale meat available um, is so-called scientific whaling. So that's the Japanese, the Norwegians, and the and the Icelanders, yeah. So, I mean, the, the science, the science that comes out of the so-called scientific whaling, actually, I think in, uh, how long have they been scientifically whaling? 20 years. I think they uh, have published one, the Japanese have published one paper. Now, they do have their own little journal that nobody reads, that they publish a lot of their findings in, but it's not peer-reviewed, so <coughs> it really, you know, it doesn't really hold up very well. Um, I mean, we know it's not scientific. You know, we know it's not real. So, so what are you going to do? It's, it's part of the International Whaling Commission. The Convention for the Regulation of Whaling allows them to do that, and that's the deal. So. What does a great whale consume? Is it correct? Actually, smaller. It eats uh, copepods, which are about the size of a grain of rice, and um, they eat a lot of them. I think we estimated. On a good day, they could eat a billion copepods. <laughs> so, that's a lot of copepods. And is that figure a continuous? Um, are they eating constantly every every day, or do they take breaks? Well, they obviously take break, breaks for sex. <laughs> Actually, I think that. Um, Copepod aggregations are created by a combination of oceanographic conditions and maturation rates of the copepods. And in some places, uh, right whales can tank up, so to speak. The extremely ex efficient metabolism at converting the lipid, I mean, when you look at a copepod in a microscope, it's about 70, when it's fully mature, a stage five copepod, um, fully mature is about 70% lipid. So right whales are able to convert that into blubber very efficiently because when you look at the feces, it's only about 2% fat. So they're extremely good at converting that, and they process 1,000 pounds of copepods a day if they can. So the con I mean, you know, it's whale-sized. We're talking whale-sized stuff here. We're not talking about the Big Mac. Um, and they, uh, in places like the Bay of Fundy and Roseway Basin and certain times in Cape Cod Bay and certain times in the Great South Channel, there are concentrations of copepods that you see on an echo sounder that are really, really dense, more than a thousand, uh, more than 10,000 animals per cubic meter. So, so all they have, and right whales, you know, they skim, they feed by skimming like a grain combine, their mouth is open, so this stuff is just going in and getting caught on the inside. They, they can probably put away, you know, thousands of pounds in a few hours. So they can reach their metabolic requirements uh, in a high density patch in a few hours, and then they can tank up, put some more fat on in, in probably six or seven hours. And when food is good, then you see more fooling around at the surface. You see that courtship stuff, you see cu more curiosity, and in fact, you'll see sleeping. Um, we came out into the Bay of Fundy one day at five in the morning or something, and we didn't see any whales. There were no whales around. So we shut down and we're thinking, what are we going to do now? And all around us, you hear, there was a line of about 40 whales at the surface, all of them asleep. <laughs> it was amazing. 
It wouldn't be so good if a ship came down, but on the other hand, we were well inside the shipping lanes, but <clears throat> they sleep, so, yeah. Do you have an explanation for spy hopping? This Quite down. Uh, in, yes. There are a lot of different answers, In the case of gray whales, which are known to spy hop a lot, there is some feeling that they may be checking to make sure that the shoreline is still there, you know, and that they're trying, because they're coastal migrators and they pretty much move up and down the coast from uh, Baja to Alaska. So that's one possibility. I think they're smarter than that. They don't probably really need to look, you know, they can probably tell from the bottom and the noise and everything else. Um, a lot of spy hopping in the case of right whales, you don't see it very often. A lot of people think that spy, spy hopping is actually their eye looking at you, but it's not very common that the eye comes above the water. The eye usually is still submerged beneath the water even though the nose may stick out. Um, so it's difficult to know. They probably, they could be looking around. Their eyesight's not great above the water because it's, uh, it's modified for underwater vision. So. Yeah. Um, I know uh, Cornell's bioacoustic research program and Woods Hole are involved in a whale listening project. What whale species are they listening for or are they listening for a bunch of, you know, all different species and how is that affecting any shipping changes? Uh, have you been on their website? It's a, it's, they've got some, uh, these listening stations set up in real time through cell phones that are uh, online. I think you can, uh, I think you can check the, they're for right wells, and they're, you can check the detections at the Cornell website, uh, Laboratory of Ornithology. And um, that, those were put in because uh, the offshore LNG ports that were built off of Boston, part of the requirement was that they install these things and that if whales are detected by the system, that the LNG ships will slow down to 10 knots as they approach the port. So that's what that does. I think it's a good system. It's a good idea. Uh, what's interesting is that there's hardly a month when they don't hear a right whale. So one could say, well, let's take the darn system out and just slow all the ships down to 10 knots all the time because that would accomplish pretty much the same thing. So, but in the meantime, it's really cool. You can go listen. Or you can't listen. You can, there might be some representative sounds. But they're listening for those up calls that I played you. And they're really easy to detect mathematically. So the system does it automatically. And then the detection shows up on the buoy that they heard it on. So it's kind of cool. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.